Well, New Life, how's everyone doing at 11.30 today? You guys are doing good? Excited to be here, see each other. Uh, if we haven't met, my name's Wes, looking around the room and just see a lot of familiar faces, but also recognizing you might be here and you're new and you're jumping in and it came with a friend and uh, just glad that you're here today. Uh, I think today's going to be one of those Sundays you just go, okay, loved that Sunday, totally remember that Sunday, something special happened in my heart. Really, two. One is, this is we've been in this series um, that's uh, called The Napkin Dream, looking at the story and life of Joseph in the Bible and the dream God gave him. It's just a great story. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I think you're going to love that. We've just each week kind of walking through. But not only that, I get to introduce to you today a very good friend of mine that I just love. And um, he gets to speak today, and I told him that you guys are really nice. Um, <laughs> but um, he's somebody that I met, uh, uh, he was 18 years old, I, I, I was the new youth pastor, I think I met him on a basketball court, and I think you were trying to take a charge. Yes. And so um, he fouled me, but I, I was, was playing defense, you know, straight up. Did, did, and and I, I think I just plowed him yeah, over. Yeah, new youth pastor trying to make a good impression on students in the youth ministry, it was perfect. Tons of influence gained in my life in that moment. Yeah, that's where ministry starts. You, mm -hmm. you, you just run them over. So, um, <laughs> so that's where we met, and it's been fun to watch over the years to be able to be part of his wedding, to watch him in ministry, and now watch him to plan a church. Got a great story of what God's done in his life with a lot of turns in it. And, um, you know, he out, got to, to pastor for a while at a church, a 10, 15,000 person church, and his focus was the Monday through Saturday of really discipling, caring, and loving, and apprenticing people. And you'll hear, I think, today that God has something he wants to say to our church, specifically about the Monday through Saturday and how God uses us to be people becoming the church in our neighborhoods and at our schools. So I'm so excited for you to hear this. Uh, would you welcome with me Richie Shaw. Thanks, Wes. Uh, this is super, um, just a huge honor for me to be here with you this morning, I think. Uh, uh, very humbled to be in this opportunity. You know, Wes has been a mentor of mine. He's been a, a, a man that has poured massive amounts of, of passion, prayer into my life, and, and uh, stand here with a ton of humility and excitement about what God has been doing in my life and in, through me and, and in my family's life and, and here at New Life. I'm just blown away to see what God has been doing and is currently doing in you and through you. I think a, an entire peninsula here is being transformed by the power and by the love of Jesus because of your willingness to engage in this mission with Jesus of really people becoming the church. I love that. I love that because I believe that every single one of us has been given a purpose and a plan for our lives from God, the creator of the universe, the one that knows you perfectly, intimately. Some of you walked in here today feeling zero plan, zero purpose for your lives, and you're excited to hear what that might look like. Others of you are not excited at all to be here. You're just kind of biding time, just getting through the church thing because someone asked you or drug you here. And I'm excited because I believe no matter where you're at, God can speak to you today. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do is, is really go with me through this conversation. If you would, if you've got one of these yellow Bibles, you can open that up to Genesis 41. That's page 34 in this Bible. If you've got a Bible app or your own Bible, you can go to Genesis. It's at the very beginning chapter 41. I also want you to grab this out of your, out of your program bulletin thing there. Um, take this out. There's some notes. I'm going to ask you to write some stuff down, and I'm going to encourage you this way as we get talking here. I really feel like I'm going to do my part as best as I can. I want to bring God's word. I want to bring the passion, the energy that I believe that God uh, wants us to have when it comes to his word, but I can't really do your part for you. Does that make sense? I, I really... Um, would just ask and expect that you would just put your heart in a posture of learning, in a posture of uh, anticipation and expecting God to speak to you. I believe he can and he will. In fact, he promises if we would seek him with our whole heart, we'd actually be found by him. And, and I want you to experience God at work in your heart today. And so I ask you to lean in, grab a pen, grab these notes, and, and, and we'll, we'll talk through that together this morning. Do you mind if I do something real quick? I'd love to just pray as we uh, enter into this time together. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we need you right now. I ask God that um, you would help me to have your heart in, in meeting, kind of hear God with this 1130 crowd. Lord, I pray that you would be working specifically in their hearts, God. Everyone in this room, God, we ask you just passionately to speak to us through your word. 
We ask, God, that you would just bring your heart alive for us in this time, God. We, we need you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, New Life, I, uh, I want to tell you this, that um, God has just been doing amazing things. I want to introduce you to my family. They're up here on the screen. This is my wife, Katie, my two little girls, Faith and Ruby. We planted a church together two and a half years ago. Uh, these are my heroes. I got to tell you that. These, these girls are my heroes. They give sacrificially to the mission. They, they love passionately. They serve so much in ministry. Uh, many of you do have no idea what planting a church looks like, sounds like, tastes like, none of that. Uh, it is massive amounts of sacrifice, massive amounts of just prayer and sweat and, and, and just, uh, just pouring our lives out for the kingdom of God. When I was uh, 18 years old, God gave me a napkin dream. Some of you are, are experiencing and exploring what this dream that God is putting in your heart looks like. He called me specifically to pastor people and to pastor pastors. I had no idea what that looked like. Much like Joseph's dream, he's sharing about, you know, hey, brothers, you're going to, one day you're going to bow down before me, and that's going to be awesome. And they go, yeah, right, we're going to beat you and throw you in a pit, right, and sell them into slavery and, and, and then get wrongly accused and put into prison. And, and, and Joseph's napkin dream that we kind of experience or think about in, in our lives kind of feels like it has some massive moments of excitement and massive moments of disappointment and disillusionment and frustration. My story is one like that as well. God calls me to pastor people, pastor pastors. I start sharing that dream. Many of my friends and, and co-students at the university were not excited about some of that. None of them were objected to it, but kind of just passive about it. And I get to a moment where I thought it was going to be extremely amazing. It was the first moment I really resonated with the story of Joseph. I get to a, a dream conference specifically for young leaders coming into the church and learning how to, how to pastor. And this whole conference was built around really understanding your dream for your life and becoming that man or that woman that God had called you to be. And I'm just like, this is exactly what I want to experience. This is what I need to hear. We're in Southern California and, and, and really excited about this conference. And I get there and we have this moment where we get like an hour alone with the guy that's putting on the conference, this big leader, you know, multiplied thousands of people impacted for the kingdom of God, amazing influence in the, in, in, throughout the, the world, and I'm just so humbled to be in his office with them. And there's just a few of us, and he's going around one by one, and he's asking us what our dreams are. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. I'm so excited to share my dream. This guy's going to be able to give me wisdom. I'm sitting right next to him, so I can't wait to be able to share and just have them, you know, look into it. And what, what he does is so awesome. I mean, each person shares their dream. It would be like you saying, like, this is what God is calling me to. And he's like, oh, I can see that in you. Oh, I believe that God's going to use you to do that. Oh, I can just see that happening in your life. Oh, I'm so excited for you. You know, he's just encouraging, inspiring, and I'm just like, man, this is awesome. He finally gets to me all the way around the circle. I'm the last guy on, on, in this conversation, and I go, hey, I'm just so excited to share. God, I believe, has called me to pastor people. This is my napkin dream. I'm laying it out there, right? Pastor people and pastor pastors. He looks at me and he goes, pastor pastors? Huh, interesting. Well, anyway, thank you all for coming today. And, and he wraps up the conversation. I mean, he just literally takes my dream and just kind of chucks it to the side, right? And this is a moment where I'm just I'm like, oh, no, I think God's called me. Hey, dream guy, you got a dream with me, right? <laughs> He's not into it at all. Joseph has a story where, I mean, moment after moment, story after story, part after part, where he just kind of constantly is battling this dream actually happening in his life. Genesis 41, though, is such a cool moment because he actually starts to see some of this fulfillment happening in his life. He was forgot about for two years while he's in prison. He had just interpreted this, this cupbearer and this baker's dreams and and one of them gets released from prison, and he says to him, remember me when you're in the presence of the king, when you're in the presence of Pharaoh, the ruler of the world at that time. Remember me, Joseph says. Two years, the guy forgot about him. Two years, he continues to sit in prison while this dream is not happening. And he comes to this moment, finally, two years later, where Pharaoh has a dream, he has this dream about these seven fat cows, and then, then there's these seven skinny cows, and the seven skinny cows eat the fat cows, and he wakes up. And he's like, what, what is going on, right? We would probably be disturbed by that dream as well. He goes back to sleep, and then there's these seven fat kind of nice heads of grain, and then there's these seven kind of weary, brittle, broken heads of grain, and, and, and the skinny, broken ones eat or devour the other ones, and he wakes up again, and he's, he's really kind of at angst, and he's uh, really kind of worried about this dream that God's given him here in these dreams and so he calls all of his magicians he calls all these people trying to kind of make it happen 
with his own power, with his own understanding, trying to kind of figure out this dream that is nobody can interpret it at all. And here's where the story gets really cool in, in verse 9. I, I want you to look at this with me. Finally, the king's chief cupbearer spoke up. He says, today I have been reminded of my failure. This is 41, chapter 41, verse 10. Some time ago, you were angry with the chief baker and me, he's saying this to Pharaoh, and you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard. One night, the chief baker and I each had a dream, and each dream had its own meaning. There was a young Hebrew man with us in the prison who was a slave of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he told us what each of our dreams meant, and everything happened just as he had predicted. I was restored to my position as cupbearer, and the chief baker was executed and impaled on a pole. Dude had a bad dream, right? Executed, impaled on a pole. Verse 14, Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once, and he was quickly brought from the prison. Cool moment. Very cool moment. Joseph was sent for at once by Pharaoh, brought from the prison. After he had shaved, changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, and no one here can tell me what it means, but I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. This is a very big moment in Joseph's life. A moment where it looks like maybe some of this dream is going to start to finally unfold in front of me. Some of you have got these napkin dreams in your life, and you've been dreaming for, for decades, for years, about the way that this dream ought to go, could go, should go, needs to go. And in many of our cases, I don't know if you're like me, but we have a tendency to really focus on what the dream is, what it's going to look like, how it's going to go, and the timing that it's going to happen in, right? Kind of the exact steps. I, I can't imagine Joseph in this story and trying to navigate the uncertainty of being sold by his brothers into slavery or the uncertainty of being wrongly accused and thrown into prison or the uncertainty of, you know, kind of giving these guys the answer to their dreams and then being forgot about for two years. But some of us can relate very well to the twists and turns of Joseph's story. You know, God, uh, my life was so, um, God's faithfulness has just been so amazing in, in my life. It's just mind-blowing to see, but most of my life, I have not seen it that way as God's faithfulness or God's grace. In fact, there was a time when, when, you know, God had called me to pastor, and then I go through school. I get to intern under Wes for like four years. I mean, it was an amazing time to be invested in by this man. I mean, a key relationship in my life has been your lead pastor here, Wes Davis. He, he has been so willing to pour his life in, and, and, and at the same time, all these other key relationships and influences have just been so massive in my life, and get to a place where I get out of school. He gets me my first job in ministry, and it's an amazing opportunity. My wife is from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I'm from Paulsbo. I graduated from North Kitsap way back in 97. Some of you seniors and, you know, high schoolers in the room, you're like, wow, old guy, right? 97. I don't know. Many of you weren't even born then. I don't know, but, but uh, it, was, it was a crazy time. Go to Northwest, this university over on the east side of Seattle, invested in massively, get my first job in Tacoma. We, my wife from Coeur d'Alene and me from Paulsbo moved to the hilltop of Tacoma. I don't know if you know the hilltop of Tacoma, but that's as far from Paulsbo and Coeur d'Alene as you could possibly ever be. Uh, and, and not in terms of, of anything wrong with the hilltop, but we had never been there. I'll just say that. And we were engaged in middle school or, high, or, or junior high ministry. That's another thing. God called me to pastor people, not junior hires, right? I'm just kidding. No, I love you middle schoolers. But uh, uh, I was just blown away by the intensity of six, seven, eight hundred, you know, junior hires coming on Friday nights. And, and I got to preach the gospel for literally like five minutes out of whack every Friday night. And, and I would get gum thrown at me. I remember we had people come. We had these ministry teams in our school at Northwest. It was so funny. They would come and they'd do these little skits and like tell all these jokes. And the kids would boo them and like throw stuff at them and they'd leave crying. And I, and I had to call the school and, like, apologize to them for, like, sending their ministry teams to the hilltop at the coma, right? And uh, this was an adventure time for us as a, as a family. And, and um, we, uh, we got the call that really, I think, I felt like this was napkin dream fulfillment moment. Wes calls me. We get together, and we, he ends up hiring us back at my home church, the church that I had grown up at in Paulsbo. And I was so excited. He was a youth pastor there, and he kind of orchestrated a lot of multiple parts of the, the church is just growing massively, and I was going to work with the young adults specifically at the church there, and, and you guys, New Life had just gotten started on Sunday nights at this time. You were meeting at the 
at the building there in Paulsbo, and, and this was before, you know, all of this kind of, you guys moved to Silverdale and all that stuff. This is, many of you have no idea about some of the history of New Life, but this is kind of where it began. And I was so excited uh, just to be a part of the team, and I remember I'd been there three weeks, like dreams starting to happen, dreams are coming true, napkin dream, it's happening, God's leadership, I can just see his faithfulness, this is so amazing, three weeks I'd been there. I was getting ready to go preach at like a, 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 high, a high school winter camp or something like that. And Wes was like, hey, let's go for a walk. I'm like, okay, more investment. Dude's going to pray for me. I love my mentor, right? So excited. And he goes, hey, I got something I need to tell you about. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, we're taking New Life, New Life, these, these, this Sunday night service. And we're, we're going to actually separate from this church in Paul's and We're going to go start it sovereignly or separately out here in, in Central Kitsap somewhere. And uh, need you to stay here and kind of hold down the fort with the guys here in Paulsville. And it felt like for me, like, to get to work with all these guys at New Life and, the, and kind of all my best friends that I've gone to school with and all of this kind of, like, dream come true and all in a moment, literally in a breath, watching all of this just go completely away. The place where over the next 18 months I became very frustrated, I became very bitter, I became very disillusioned at what I thought this napkin dream was supposed to look like, when it was supposed to happen, how it was supposed to happen, and I just got to a place where I quit. I quit ministry, I quit the church, I quit trying to be a pastor, I quit all of this. I had a six-month-old all the, at the time, Faith, my oldest there, she was six months old at the time. I packed all of our stuff up and I said, hey, we're, we're out of here, Kate, to my wife. And she said, okay, well, if you're going to quit the ministry or whatever you're doing, let's go do it by my family. She's from Coeur d'Alene. So we moved to Coeur d'Alene and uh, we moved into my in-law's basement. Napkin dream right here, right? <laughs> Sleeping on the floor in my in-law's basement. And every night I'd come home, my wife would go, graciously, mind you, graciously. Hey, babe, what's the plan? What do you, what do you mean? We're, you know, working and sleeping on the floor and... She goes, this is not the plan. What's the plan? This is not the plan. And, and it became this refining moment where I, I started to recognize that because circumstances didn't work the way I thought they should, they could, the way they needed to, they didn't fit into my idea of the way this napkin dream was going to go, didn't mean that I wasn't supposed to continue to become the man that God had called me to be. And I think some of you have, have encountered circumstances like Joseph's, like mine, where, where the napkin dream is a, now a distant, far-off thought, a, a maybe, a potentially someday, I wonder if, and you're not passionately pursuing God's leadership in your life to become this man or this woman that God has called you and made you to be. Because you've become disillusioned, you've been frustrated, you've been hurt, you feel like it's not going the way it's supposed to go. Joseph's story gives us great hope. There's a moment here that he comes to that I believe every one of us want long dream to come to. Where the scraping, the clawing, the wondering, the like, ah, oh, is it ever going to happen? Is this life ever going to matter? Is significance ever going to come? Is my soul ever going to be satisfied? Am I ever going to actually prove what I think I'm going to prove? And is it going to come to pass? It's starting to happen in his life. Here's my fear, though, for us as new life, as people trying to become the church. My fear is this, that in our concern and our desire to become these people that God has made us and called us to be, to see this napkin dream fulfilled, we may very well miss the moment that Joseph is experiencing because we are focused on the wrong thing. We might miss it altogether because we are focused on the wrong thing. Joseph has an acute awareness throughout his story you see it specifically while he's in jail when this cupbearer and this baker come to him. And when the cupbearer is released, his words to that cup, Joseph's words to that cupbearer, remember me. Joseph has an acute understanding and awareness of what is going to help his napkin dream come to pass in his life. His people. You can write this down on your notes. You can write it down like this, that opportunities in our lives follow relationships. Opportunities follow relationships. Joseph asked the, the, the cupbearer, hey, remember me. He intentionally makes this connection to not miss any opportunities that God may want to do in his life or through his life. And I believe some of us may miss the dream, the fulfillment of this dream in our lives because we are focused too much on the wrong thing. What would be the wrong thing? I believe for many of us, we are concerned with what this dream is, the way it's supposed to go, 
the timing of it going down. We're really focused on what it looks like and, and what it's going to be like and, and, and what it's going to feel like and what it's going to go like. And I remember uh, there's so many moments in my story where, you know, I go to Wes and I'm like, hey, Wes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pastor people. Teach me how to pastor people. And he says, okay, here's the first thing you need to do. You need to go set up those chairs. No, I think you heard me wrong. I got a napkin dream here. I'm going to pastor people. Yeah. Yeah, I need you to set up chairs. Make them straight, too. Like none of this crooked stuff, right? I was joking with your setup team earlier. I could do straighter lines than these or these rows right here. He, he, he gets me focused on this, on this task that's in front of me. I'm like, really? But he started to help me to see that there's this faithfulness piece in the kingdom of God where Jesus said, hey, if I can trust you with a few things, I can trust you with more. I can tell you at that point in my life, Jesus could not trust me with people. He could definitely trust me with things. Some of us have really no awareness of the relationships in our lives. We've been so focused on what our dream is and what it looks like and what it's going to look like that we have missed the who. And I believe that the, the who that God has brought into our lives is, is the most critical thing for us to experience the fulfillment of becoming the men and the women that God has called us to be. I would hate it if you walked out of here today focused on what your dream is and what it looks like and what it's going to feel like and all this what and missed the who that God is bringing into your life. I look at this, and I, I want to line this up so you understand, biblically speaking, from God's word. In the very beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, the very first conflict in scripture is when he recognized that man was alone. This is before sin entered the world. Man was alone, and God said it is not good for man to be alone. Some of us have been isolated, doing life by ourselves, trying to make our napkin dream happen. And we're frustrated because the what is not happening and we are not at all focused on who God has brought into our lives. We have isolated ourselves intentionally, kind of distanced ourselves from people in the pursuit of our dream. Making our napkin dream happen, we got to make this thing happen. We got to get there. We got to get this what done. We got we to get it happen now, right? And many of us are missing completely the who, the people that God has brought into our lives. When this world began dis being destroyed, when this first sin in Genesis 3 entered into the world, the things that were destroyed in that moment of sin or disobedience towards God were real relationship with God. God used to walk in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He, he walked in the cool of the evening with him. This intimate connection with God and man was destroyed. He put him out of the garden. The other thing that was destroyed was intimate, real relationship with person and person, with people. As soon as God walked into the garden in, in Genesis 3, you can see this in Scripture. He walked in the garden. He says, hey, Adam, where are you? He goes, well, we're hiding. Well, why are you hiding? Man had never hidden from God up to that point. Genesis 2, the last verse in Genesis 2 is the man and woman, they were naked and felt no shame. Well, why are you hiding? Because we're naked. Who told you you were naked? God asked. This is where the breakdown in real relationship between Adam and Eve happened and started. Well, this woman you gave me, History of mankind, there had never been hiding, there had never been shame, there had never been blaming. But now this broken relationship between God and the broken relationship between each other started to manifest itself throughout all of creation. We experienced the pain of that brokenness. In fact, most of the fulfillment that we are longing for, that we are scraping and clawing for in this life, comes down to this basic design that we were made to be in relationship with God and made to be in relationship with each other but are incapable of both. We can't have either one left to ourselves. Outside of a relationship with Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the one that has the capacity to make you right with God and give you a heart to make you right with others, you are doomed to failure. The good news is, though, is that you walk in here today tired of scraping and clawing, tired of trying to make this dream happen, make significance happen, tired of just kind of trying to make purpose for yourselves, and you're finally willing to admit today, I can't do this anymore. I can't run this life. I can't make this happen. I can't be fulfilled on my own. This soul will never get satisfied in of myself, and you're finally willing to come to grips with that and make amends with the creator of the universe today through his son, Jesus Christ, and, and come to him in faith that he has the ability to make you right with God and give you his spirit to empower you to love others. I love that Jesus, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Matthew 22. 
He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The very thing that Jesus said, all the law and the prophets, everything of the Old Testament hangs on this statement. They asked him for one and he gave them two. God is concerned with our relationship with each other. For us to try to make our napkin dream all about the what and miss the who, I believe we will miss the heart of God. I don't think God would give you a dream that does not include people. That's how far I would go to say. I believe that God cares so much about us being intimately connected with him and with each other. All of creation, all of the story of this, this scripture right here is God learning and teach not him learning, but learning us, teaching us how to be in relationship with him and with each other. For us to miss the who in our lives, we will miss the napkin dream. This moment that Joseph is experiencing, this moment of fulfillment, I mean, it goes on right after this where, where he interprets the d dream accurately and then Pharaoh puts him in charge of all of, uh, of this grain distribution and literally second in command in all of Egypt. I mean, the moment is happening. The fulfillment is starting to happen. We do not want to miss this moment in our lives where this napkin dream starts to happen and we will miss it if we focus too much on what. We are trying to accomplish what it looks like, when I'm going to do it, how I got to make it happen, and miss the who that God has brought into our lives. I believe that the very people that we are overlooking, sidestepping, blaming, hiding from, are the very people that God wants to use to help us to become the men and women that God has called us and designed us to be. And to miss those people, we will miss this dream that God is putting in our heart. And I believe that many of us struggle because we don't know exactly what the dream is going to look like. And I would challenge you with this. Start with who God has brought in front of you. Who is it that he's asking you to forgive? Who is it that he's asking you to apologize to? Who is he trying to restore relationship with you and this person? Who is it that God has brought into your life that you have been annoyed by? That's a good test right there. Who's annoying you the most right now? I believe they could be the person that God actually wants to use in your life to help you become this man or this woman that he has called you, made you, designed you to be. And, and by us being obstinate or frustrated or annoyed by these people, we miss the very thing, the very people that God wants to use us in their lives. And I think for me that, that, that just kills me about this conversation is that I believe God has made us, created us to be in relationship with him and with each other. And to try to make our napkin dream all about the what and miss the who, my heart breaks for you. I want so much for you to experience this moment like Joseph has. For me to stand here today is a very redemptive moment. I never dreamt of this. I never dreamt that I would, I would move to Idaho and I'd, I'd encounter a man like Jim Pubman who called me. I mean, a church of like 5,000 at the time when I got there. He invests his life in me for like six months and then hires me as this group's pastor. I was a small group's pastor. I had no idea how to lead small groups. I didn't like people, right? I was just called to pastor them. I didn't have to like them, right? If I could just preach, I'll tell you what, a lot of pastors think that way. I love that your, your lead pastor, Wes, he's out here, he's seating people, he's, he's with you in the crowd. I mean, he's not, he's not distant, far off, but that's how I always seen lead pastors. They were distant, far off, CEO, corner office, untouchable. This guy, Jim, he calls me the day after I sent him an email just thanking him for a sermon. Blew me away. He takes me to coffee. He, he spends two hours with me. These guys, these, he doesn't have time. He doesn't have two hours. He can't give this time away. I know, I can do the math. I've been in the church world before. I walked away from it. I know what it takes. There is no way. He's blowing my entire paradigm. And what he is helping me to see is that the who that God is bringing him is more important than the what he wants to accomplish. It was blowing my, my, my complete paradigm away of what I thought church and ministry ought to be. God was helping me to see that it's not about the what. It's not just about the services and the great programs and the great cramps, but it's about the people that God is bringing us. For us to become a people who are becoming the church that God has called us to be and has designed us to be means that we are going to have to learn to not focus so much on the what and start to focus on the who, the people that God has put in our lives. I believe you have a neighbor that if you would just walk across the cul-de-sac, God would use you to help them come to know faith in Jesus Christ. If you would just walk across the street, you have a coworker that talks way too loud on the phone in the cubicle next to you. But I believe that if you would spend literally just five minutes, that you would learn to be sacrificial with the what in your life. 
that you're so busy, so consumed with, I believe that God would use you in these people's lives and your dream would start to happen. These opportunities in our lives to become the men and the women that God has called us to be follow these relationships. For us to miss the relationships, we are missing the boat. My heart for you is to not miss this dream that God has for your life. A prayer would be that as a people on this peninsula that we would learn to become the men and women that God has called us to be and that we would learn to engage with the people that he is bringing us. It is going to mean looking past other people's faults. It is going to mean asking for forgiveness. It is going to mean fighting for unity and reconciliation in our families. You know what? Jesus prayed in John 17. He's praying for his disciples and then he begins to pray for us, anybody that would believe in him through their message. He prays this in John 17, I think it's 20, 21, 22. He says, Father, make them one. Make them unified just as you and I are one. So he's praying that has, if you read scripture, if you don't know Jesus' life, his story is so much of him and the Father being intimately connected. You see it all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the Gospels of Jesus. The intimacy that him and the Father display, he's praying that we would have this kind of unity, this kind of intimacy. And this is what he says, so that the world will know that you sent me. I believe that us being in real relationship with each other is the greatest testimony witness to this peninsula, that God really does exist. Our inability to, to love each other and forgive each other and, and, and focus on the who that God has brought into our lives proves that God really doesn't have any power in everybody else's minds. Yeah, if they can't love each other, how can they love anybody else? And many times as a church, this is our greatest struggle is just being who we say we are. But I believe it's possible. You look at the fruit of the Spirit. By his, by his Spirit inside of us, we can learn to love, be patient, be kind, be gentle, be good, be faithful, have self-control. We can have these things in our heart by the power of God, the Spirit of God inside of us. We can become people who are becoming the people that God has called us and designed us to be in real relationship with him and real relationship with each other. And here's the hope in this conversation today that you would grab a hold of. Do not miss the people that God is bringing into your life. Do not be so focused on the what of your napkin dream that you miss the people, the relationships that God has brought you. Your opportunities to become that man or that woman that God has called you and designed you to be will follow the relationships in your life. So many times I've missed opportunities because I have thrown away the relationships in my life. I've walked away. I think one of my greatest failures is to not stay connected with the people that God has brought into my life. How many opportunities I have missed because I've just allowed relationships to fall away, relationships to just go away, relationships just to stay at a comfortable distance. I believe God has called us to more than that. The very essence of his church is he says, you, they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. God is calling us today to not be so focused on the what, but on the who. Our opportunities to become the men and women that God has called us to be will follow the relationships that he has given us. The band is coming right now, and I want to close today. I just want to say this to you in the room that are skeptical about Jesus and do not want to follow Jesus because you have never seen Jesus for who he really is. I, want to just, I just want to encourage you this way, those of you that kind of have your arms folded, checked out a little bit right now, that I believe that the love of God is available to you today and is actually being displayed to you right now. The fact that you're sitting in this room that you maybe don't even want to be in I believe is evidence of God's love and his leadership in your life. That he wants so much for you to understand the peace, the grace, the hope, the freedom that is possible, that he's willing to have that person invite you here today, that he's willing to, to get you in this door so that you can hear this conversation about what he's really like, that you would actually just take a step today to begin to trust him for the leadership of your own life. I'm praying that you're sick and tired of trying to lead your own life. That you're tired of trying to make it work. You're tired of the scraping and the clawing. That today, you're finally going to lay down this kind of demanding posture that you've had on God and on Christians. You're going to say, okay, I know they're not perfect, God. 
I'm trusting you to show me yourself, to reveal your love. I'm gonna just ask you, God, what do you want from this life? Others of us have been so consumed with the what of our napkin dream that we have not really included God at all in this conversation. Only at this capacity, God bless my dream. I believe if it's God's leadership in your life, he's gonna continue to bring you the people to focus on. Many of us get so focused on ourselves, we miss the heart of God and the dreams of God in our lives. I believe today he's going to just begin to kind of strip some of that selfishness from us and help us to look at the people that he's brought around us, not as annoyances or inconveniences, as actually the vehicle, the relationships that he wants to accomplish his will, his purposes through. This is a massive shift for many of our hearts. We tolerate people, don't we? Today, some of us, our hearts are going to break. We're actually going to start to love people, not just tolerate them. God shifted my heart massively, even as a pastor. When I started recognizing that the fulfillment of my napkin dream was much like Joseph's, not just about me becoming some guy, some church planner that proves that he can plant a church, but actually becoming a man that cares about you, cares about your dream, cares about the man, the father, the husband that God has called you and designed you to be. I believe that I exist to inspire you, to inspire people to become the people that God has called you to be. I hate for this moment to slip by where you don't really come to grips with the economy of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, his people. For us to miss people, we are missing God's heart. Here's how I want to teach you to pray. Today, this afternoon, tomorrow morning. God, help me to see. Give me your eyes. Help me to see people that you see. And help me to see them the way you see them. And I also want to ask you to pray this too. God, help me to have your heart for these people. Because I don't love them in of myself. Teach me to love them the way you love them. So this, this is the prayer. God, give me your eyes. God, give me your heart. I want to see people the way you see people. Not as obstacles, but as opportunities. I want to, I want to care for people the way you care for people. Not as kind of inconveniences, God. But I want to actually love them. I don't want to tolerate them. I want to love them. God, give me your eyes. Give me your heart. Would you stand with me today? I want to close this in prayer. Maybe you would close your eyes with me. Just focus your heart. Who are the people that you've been missing? Because you've been so focused on the what. I'm asking that God would just bring their faces into your heart right now and just begin to pray for them. Some of you, it's been a long time since you prayed for somebody besides yourself. Just begin to pray for these people. God, how do you want me to speak encouragement into their life? How do you want me to, to love these people? Just begin to pray for them. Some of you in a place of surrender, maybe for the first time, they're saying, God, I want your plans, your dreams for my life, not mine. You can just maybe put your hands in the air in a kind of a place of surrender before God. Some of you, this is the first time you've said this. Others of you, you just need to say it again today and surrender, God. What are your plans? What is this napkin dream you're writing for my life? Who are the people that you're gonna bring me? Jesus, I just lift up your church. I lift up new life to you right now, God. Every single heart in this room. God, I pray that you would bring your peace beyond all circumstances in the midst of the chaos and the turmoil of broken lives and marriages, hurting kids, lost jobs. I pray right now through the midst of all these circumstances that we're facing today, God, you would speak your peace. You would speak your life. You would speak your hope. You would speak freedom, God just into our hearts right now. God, for those of us convinced that our dream needs to happen this way, that way, whatever, God, we've been missing the who, focused on the what. God, break our hearts. Show us the people that we are to be engaged with. Help us to love like you love. Give us your heart. Give us your eyes, oh God. 
I want to see people the way you see people, not the way I see them, God, in myself. Help me to see them the way you do, God. Help me to love them the way you do, God. God, I pray for every person in this room that you would just bring a refreshing of passion to become the man or the woman that you have made them to be. God, bring a, a heart full of fire and conviction to walk out of here empowered, inspired today to be the men and women, to become the church that you are calling us to be. God, we love you. We trust you. We surrender to you, oh God. In Jesus' name.